Hello and welcome to the 25th lecture. So today we're going to be talking about another topic that I particularly enjoy explaining and that's optimization. Because this is some of the practical payoff from knowing some part of this machine called calculus, this language called calculus. And um, the payoff is, is very significant and what we are using to get this payoff is really not not particularly advanced things, it's rather basic things. And this is using the tools of calculus to optimize and find the best solution to various practical problems. Uh, so the easiest way for me to try and explain this is to just do perhaps a couple of examples, and then we'll backtrack and see how, how we're getting to these answers. And uh, we'll start with the following example. So example, a farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing. And wants to fence off some part of his land to create a fence, to create a field. But the party wants to fence off is right next to a river. So part of his land next to a river. And he wants to create a rectangular field. Okay. What is the biggest field he can create? Okay, so we start by drawing a picture. So this is the river. Let's make it blue. And the farmer wants to create a field. So it's a rectangular field, so its sides are gonna look like this, right? And then what are the dimensions? Well, this we could call Y, and then this thing we call X. If it's a rectangular field, that's all we have to choose, right? We have to choose its depth, and we have to choose its length. Yeah. So what are we going to do? Well, it's kind of analogous to the, to the uh, related rates type uh, questions in that we translate all of this stuff in the language of words, into the language of maths and then formulate the problem in the language of maths and then apply our tools to it. So what do we have here? We have that there's 2,400 feet of fencing, okay? It's creating a rectangular field uh, next to a river. So uh, for some insane reason, I called both things Y. So to describe this constraint of having 2,400 feet of fencing, uh, we see that we're going to have to have this side, another side here, and then this side, right? So to express it in the language of mass, the constraint that we have is that 2y plus x equals 2,400, right? That's the constraint. Yeah? And what do we want? We want to maximize the area. And what's the area? The area is just x times y. Okay, so this is all of that stuff, right? In, written in the language of math. Yeah, and this is a function of two variables, and we are doing one variable calculus. Later, hopefully, all of you will do multivariable calculus, which is a lot more powerful. Um, but we have a constraint here which connects x and y. So we can rewrite this constraint to have x just as expressed as a function of y. So note 
And that x is equal to 2400 minus 2y. And therefore, we can express the area that we're wanting to maximize just as a function of x, right? Or just as a function of y. So let's write a of y. Instead of writing x, y, we're going to replace the x with this thing. So I have 2400 minus 2y times y. Okay. So what's that? That's minus 2y squared plus 2400 uh, y. All right, good. So this is the quantity we want to maximize, and we have to think about what possible y's we can have. Well, um, because the constraint is that 2y has to be 2400, the, the biggest we can possibly make y would be 1200, right? And if we made a, a, a rectangular field where y was 1200, then the x would have to be zero, and we have this long, uh, very long, incredibly thin, zero thickness field going straight up like this. It's probably not a good design of field, but that is theoretically possible. We can still actually have a field like that. So we have this thing, and we want to maximize over interval 0 to 1200. And now we're very happy because this is just maximizing a continuous uh, function over a closed interval, and this is exactly the topic of uh, a couple of sections ago. So um, this was the closed interval method. Hopefully you are all very familiar with this. If you're not familiar with this, then this is a kind of a, a little kind of learning point that, that being unfamiliar with previous topics means topics we discuss going forward become more and more obscure. So essential to nail down everything as we go along, build on a solid foundation. So I'm going to assume we're all happy with closed interval method. We know how to maximize the continuous function of a closed interval. We're going to look for the critical numbers, the numbers where the derivative is either not existing or is zero. This thing is a polynomial. The derivative exists all the time. So it's just where the derivative is zero. So we find the critical numbers. And that is just differentiation. So we're going to have minus 4y plus 2, 4, 0, 0. And uh, if this is equal to 0, this is equivalent to y being 600. No? So there's only one critical number in our interval, and it is at 600. Now, if we're going to use the closed interval method, we would test the value of the function on the critical number and at the endpoints, yeah? and we'd see which is bigger. Yeah? And we might expect that the guy at the critical number, the, the value of, of y at the uh, value of a at the critical number will be bigger because if y was zero, then that would be like a zero height field that would have a very small area, fact, area zero. And if y was 1200, then that's a that's a field which is just going straight up and then straight down. Again, the error is zero. So just by common sense, without even doing any calculation, we would expect that uh, that uh, that this thing will be the maximizer of the area. You know? But I'm going to show you a different method, which is going to be useful later on, and that's to not actually plug in the endpoints, but just to look at the derivative, because we have just one critical number. You know? So meaning there's, because there's just one critical number, the derivative is only going to change sign when it goes across this one critical number. And that means that um, it's either going to be positive from 0 to 600 and negative onwards, if it changes inside at all, or vice versa. You know? So if it's positive and then negative, then we're going to have something which will have a global maximum at 600, or conversely, if it's negative, and then positive, a global minimum at 600. You know? So this is a slightly different method, but let's do that because because uh, there'll be other instances when we're trying to maximize and there isn't a closed interval. So we might as well learn this new method. So look at the derivative or look at the sign. What happens? Well, for y, which is between 0, strictly between 0 and 600, What happens to this? So it's not going to change sign, right? The derivative will not change sign because the only changes to sign is 600, right? And it's a continuous function. So it's going to have the same sign for every y 
between 0 and 600. And if we take y to be very, very small, then this thing is very small. Uh, and uh, see, I don't like the way I've written that, so let me break that up. There's this thing. So let me write this like this. y prime of s equals 0 is equivalent to this. Yeah? So this is the derivative right here. Yeah? So if y is very small, this thing's very small, and we have something close to 2,400, which is positive. So we know for any y between 0 and 600 that f y will have to be positive. Yeah? Let me write that as a sentence. Then, and for y, which is between 600 and 1200, what happens? Um, again, it's not changing sign on this on this interval from 600 to 1200 uh, for the same reason that it only changes sign at 600. Um, and if we let this be uh, very close to 1200, then this thing is way more negative than than this thing. So it's actually going to have a negative sign. Then. Okay, so it is going to be positive zero, then negative, positive, then negative. So what we have here is that A will have a global maximum exactly at y is equal to 600. i.e. A of 600 is the local max, is the global max, sorry. Okay, uh, and now we can figure out the dimensions of the x because we have this constraint here, right? So from this thing here, let's call this thing star. We have that x will just have to be 1200, and that's the dimensions. So we can optimize this farmer's field, right? He has only 2400 feet of fencing, but we figured out that if we do 600 going down, going back from the river, and then 1200 going along, that is the absolute optimal design of field for him. And that's important because, you know, uh, if he has a bigger field, then potentially he can make a lot more money year by year. And uh, with a little bit of calculus, you can figure that out. It's, uh, it is a very, very accessible problem with a bit of calculus. Just written in words, with no calculus, even if you're a very smart person, you have real problems trying to understand this. Right? So this has real practical importance. Now let's do another example. Let's change color, just for fun. Okay, example. A tin can must contain one thousand milliliters of oil. What are the dimensions that minimize the cost of construction of the can? Actually, to be more specific, what are the dimensions that minimize the surface area of the can. So we're going to assume the cost of construction is just the amount of tin that is used, which might be too simple, but it's not entirely false either. That's most likely the most important thing, right? So what are dimensions that minimize the surface area of the tin can? Or, ah, let's do even better. What are the dimensions that minimize the total amount of, no, let's, let's not be too fancy, the surface area of the tin, of the can. Okay, solution. 
We're going to start by drawing a tin can, so we all know what a tin can looks like, right? Looks like this, like this, and the dimensions that define it are the radius here and then the height here. Right? Uh, and what are the constraints? Well, the constraint is that it has to contain a thousand milliliters, right? But uh, the volume of this tin can is going to be the base times the height, so that's going to be pi uh, squared, the base times the height, has to be 1,000. That's the constraint. Yeah? And then the thing we're trying to optimize is we're trying to minimize the surface area. And what's the surface area? Well, it's the tin on the top of the can, the tin on the bottom, and then the tin around the outside, right? The top and the bottom are easy to figure out, so let's write surface area. So the surface area of the top of the tin is just pi times the radius squared, right? But there's the top and the bottom. So we're going to have 2 pi uh, squared. And now we have to think about the, the surface area of the stuff around the outside. So imagine we cut the top off and cut the bottom off. And then we're just going to have just the, the sides of the tin. And let's cut it down the middle and then flatten it all out. Yeah? So if we flatten it all out, what do we see? We'll see a kind of a rectangle like this, right? where the height here would be h, right? It's flattened all out. And we're interested in what this thing is here. And this thing, if you think about it, will just be the circumference of this circle, right? Because we cut it down and we just flatten it all out. So this will be the circumference of the circle, which will be 2 pi times r. So that will be the cost of, or that will be the surface area of the sides of the tin. So the total surface area is the top and the bottom, so 2 pi r squared, plus this quantity, 2 pi r times h. Yeah, and that's the thing we want to minimize. Okay, and again, this is a function of two variables, but we have a constraint, so we can replace one of the variables with the other, so we can solve for h, and we have that h is equal to 1,000 over pi uh, squared, and then we can create a function, s of r, which just depends on r, it's going to be 2 pi r squared, and then we're going to put this h directly into this thing, right? And then what happens? If we put h directly into this thing, one of the pi's will cancel, and uh, one of the r's will cancel, and we'll just have 2,000 over r. Yeah? That is the thing that we're going to try and minimize. Now, what range of r can we have? Well, all we have is that uh, the only constraint is that the, the volume of the tin is one thousand. Volume of the tin can is one thousand milliliters. So uh, theoretically, we could make a, a tin can which has got a radius of one meter, right, and contains one thousand milliliters. It would just have to be quite a thin tin can, right? And theoretically, we could also make a tin can which has got a radius of 100 meters, right? But then it would be an incredibly thin can, but we can still create such a such a tin can and have it have a volume of a thousand milliliters. So it's very unlikely those very long, flat, pancake-like tin cans are going to be the optimal solution. But in principle, they are they are still a potential solution. They are theoretically possible. So uh, out of completeness, just in case we're wrong, um, we're going to allow any range of R, right? So and this function minimized minimized over r uh, bigger than zero. Okay, cool. So that is our problem. Now we don't have a finite interval, we have an infinite interval. So we're going to proceed the same way as before. We're going to take the derivative as prime of r. And we're going to have 4 pi r minus 2,000 over r squared. We set this equal to 0. And then we solve. And we're going to have 4 pi r is equal to 2,000 over r squared. We put the, multiply both sides by r squared and divide by 
both sides by pi uh, by four pi, and then this is equivalent to uh, to the three is equal to five hundred over pi, and therefore r has to be this the cube root of five hundred over pi. Cool. Now we can't use the closed interval method, so now we're going to have to look at the derivative. But if we do so, we find stuff pretty easily, because if we have r between 0 and between this thing, the third root of 500 over pi, then again, the derivative is not going to change sign. Here's our expression for the derivative. So we can take any convenient r we want inside this expression, whatever the sign we have, um, uh, that thing will be the sign it takes throughout this entire interval because it cannot change sign. So let's take r to be very small. So that makes the positive part very small and the negative part really huge. So it's definitely got to be negative. So yeah, this is a sentence. So four. We have. that s prime of r is less than zero. And the other way around, for r, uh, which is bigger than the third root of 500, divided by pi, then the same argument for any r bigger than this, it's always going to have the same sign because the derivative can't change sign only changes sign at the third root of 500 over pi. And then we take the most convenient r to understand the sign of this thing. We take a huge r that makes this negative part very small, this positive part very big. So we know that s prime of r is bigger than zero. So what is it doing? Between zero and the third root of 500 over pi, we have something with a negative slope and zero, then a positive slope that upwards, right? And the only thing that can possibly have such a shape is where we have a global minimizer exactly where the derivative is zero. Yeah? So global minimizer. So s of the third root of 500 over pi, global minimizer. And let's work out the other dimension. So we have a formula relating these things right here, look at this. So let's write h as two times 500 over pi times r squared. And let's put r squared directly uh, into this when r is equal to the third root of 500 over pi. So that's gonna be two times 500 over pi. And then we're gonna have 500 over pi to the 2 over 3, right? And then on the bottom here, this pi to the 2 over 3 is going to cancel the power 1 of pi here. And then this 500 to the 2 over 3 will cancel the power 1 of 500 over the top. So we'll have 2 times 500, 1 over 3. Let's write that better. over pi times 1 over 3, which is exactly just 2 times 500 pi to the 1 over 3, which coincidentally, well not coincidentally, it's a general fact, which is always true, this is twice times the radius. Yeah? It's 2 times r. So I should turn this out. And then so for r was the third root of 500 over pi. And we do this calculation. OK, so it's pretty interesting. So this means that this thing here, for the optimal dimensions of a tin can, this, the height of it is twice the radius. Now, um, if you go to your local Kroger's and you walk around and you look at the tin cans, you will notice that they do have more or less the same dimension. So a massive tin can of gherkins or whatever is going to have more or less the same dimensions as a tin can of, of baked beans. 
right? There are some specialty cans like Red Bull, which is expensive stuff. They don't care about optimizing the cost. They want to do something cool looking. But generally, if you just want to minimize your manufacturing costs of your tin can, then you will produce something of this dimensions. In fact, you can go there with your tape measure and you can measure the radius and measure the height. And you'll see that, that the radius is about uh, half of the height. Yeah? And if you go to places that really want to uh, optimize things, if you go to Costco and you look at massive tin cans, then that ratio will be even more close to being true. No? And the answer is because of calculus. You can explain to any interested person why you're doing these things and explain why the radius is going to be half of the height. That's the optimal solution. And um, that, is, uh, that is a very important thing to know. I mean, if you're manufacturing whatever, 20 million tin cans every year, and you have the dimensions of the tin can that's going to save you just a little bit, just 2% of what it would be if you did something else, that's an enormous amount of money, right? And why not do that? There's no real advantage to having a tin can with different dimensions unless you think it looks cool, right? So um, that is something that, this is something that gives you real power. Having the ability to express something, something quantitatively in the language of maths and find the optimum is, uh, is of enormous use, is enormous utility. Um, I have friends who, who work at a quite a high level, uh, uh, high level executives in business. And sometimes they talk about their work. And uh, what it sounds like they're doing is they are trying to optimize a solution or something which can be quantified. But they are not actually doing, they're not actually applying math to it. They are meeting and discussing and hearing other opinions and trying to carry out the entire thing with a bunch of very intelligent people using words. And uh, it's very tempting to, uh, to just apply some math to it, but I don't want to get sucked into the world of business. Uh, however, my experience is that, uh, that, that, that even, in, even in quite significant Fortune 500 companies at a very high level, you have people who maybe have a math qualification, maybe have lots, but they are not fluent in the language of math and they don't think about quantitative things mathematically. And uh, if you do, you are in a very strong position because, believe it or not, there is a lot of wastage because people are not trying to do this. People are not fluent in this language. In my uh, proselytizing welcome to the course video, I, I, I made the metaphor that teaching maths is, feels like being one of the few literate people in the 12th century going around trying to convince people that literacy is worthwhile. Um, and I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being hyperbolic. It literally does feel like that. Um, because there are many, many real world problems, real world situations where having fluency in this, just basic fluency in this, has enormous impact. And uh, there isn't that fluency. This society doesn't have that fluency. Uh, so. Um, if, you, if you want to have great value in society and be well rewarded, the cheapest and easiest way is to become fluent in this language. Okay, final example. So this is an example directly from the book where they have, uh, where they have a different story. I want to create a more dramatic narrative for entertainment purposes. So let's describe the situation like this. So we have a... Uh, uh, a wrongly convicted innocent man escapes from prison. This is our guy. He's escaping from prison. And he is running towards a boathouse, which is here, position A. Okay? And of the boathouse, he has a boat ready for him. And there's a river he has to get across, and the river's three kilometers wide. And on the exact opposite point of the boathouse, let's call that B, go down by eight kilometers, you have here the safe house. So this is his safe house. Okay, and it's eight kilometers down. Okay. 
So he's trying to escape. He's going to arrive at the boathouse. And then he has a choice of what to do because he can row at six kilometers an hour and can run at just eight kilometers an hour. He's not in very good shape, uh, President. So his choice are, his choices, or his choice is where to row his boat to. So he might think, okay, well, uh, I want to make the shortest path possible to my safe house, which is here. This is the safe house. So I'm just going to go directly down on a straight line from A to C. That might be his initial thought. Or he might think, well, you know, I can run much faster than I can row, or somewhat faster than I can row, so why don't I just get the rowing part done as quickly as possible, and then row directly to B and then run down. But the problem with that is that then you have a longer journey to make in total, because you'll have to run down from B to C, which is 8 kilometers. Happily, for our innocently, uh, innocent, wrongly convicted prisoner who's escaping, he did calculus. He learned some calculus when he was at university uh, or high school. And uh, he realizes that this choice he has to make of where to row his boat is a quantitative choice that he can describe in the language of maths, analyze and find the optimal place, right? And this is his thought. His thought is, okay, where I'm gonna land, let's change color to this color. Where I'm going to land, say, is going to be x kilometers down from b. Okay, x kilometers down. And that x is my choice. So the x will be somewhere between 0 and 8, right? There's no advantage going backwards or overshooting c. Yeah? And then for every particular choice of x, there's going to be some particular time that my journey is going to take. Because my journey is going to consist of rowing to this point here. Yeah? And then the second part of the journey will be running down from my landing point to my safe house. Yeah? And then we can figure out what each part of the journey is, right? Because if we look at this, let's change color again. If we look at this a little bit more closely, what do we see? We see that this is a triangle, right? It's a right angle triangle. So this part of his journey right here, where he's rowing, is just the hypotenuse of a triangle, right? Whose sides are given by 3 and x. So if we want to try and express his total journey, right, uh, what are we actually expressing? We're expressing the time it takes for him to get to the safe house. So let's write this as t of x, because it depends on the x, which is how far down from b he lands, right? And then there's the part where he's rowing, right? So we are going to find out how long that journey is, and that's just Pythagoras. It's going to be the square root of 9 plus x squared yeah. divided by uh, the speed at which you can row, which is six kilometers an hour, right? That will be the time of the rowing part of the journey. And then the next part of the journey will be his running part, where he arrives here and then runs down. And how long is this? This is just eight minus x, right? That's the distance, eight minus x, and he runs at eight kilometers an hour. And that thing is time of the journey. Okay, and obviously to maintain his freedom, or to, he, he needs to try and get to the safe house as quickly as possible. The, uh, he's being chased by the posse, so he is very concerned about his choice about where to land at X. Yeah? However, as I said, he's learned some calculus. So he realizes that he can find this optimal path by minimizing 
t of x over all reasonable solutions, which is from x between 0 and 8. So I'll minimize t of x over 0 to 8. And it's a continuous function on a closed interval. So we can use the closed interval method. Yep. In this case, we don't have to worry about a constraint. Everything is already in one variable. We just have to apply the tools that we know. So we're going to differentiate. Clean that up a little bit. So this half and the two will cancel, so we're going to have x over 6 square root of 9 plus x squared and minus 1 over 8. So t prime of x equals 0 is equivalent to uh, x over 6 square root of 9 plus x squared equals 1 over 8. And let's clean it up. Let's multiply both sides by 6 square root of 9 plus x squared. And then we're going to have x, so 6 over 8 is the same as 3 over 4 square root of 9 plus x squared. Square both sides. over 16, 9 plus x squared, and then we're going to put all the x's on one side, all the x squared's on one side, so what are we going to do? Uh, we are going to have, let's multiply through by 16 actually, so multiply through by 16, we're going to have 16 x squared, is equal to 81 plus 9x squared. Subtract across. And then we're going to have 7x squared equals 81. And therefore, x squared is equal to 81 over 7. And we take the square root. So the square root will be plus or minus this but we don't care about the minus solution, it can't mean anything. 9 over square root of 7. Yeah, uh, because we're not going to go backwards, that's just going to be the, uh, that's going to be the definitely going to make our journey longer, right? So we only are interested in x between 0 and 8. So this thing for positive solution, so x this is the critical number. In zero comma eight. Huh? All right. So uh, we could try and look at the derivative and see the sign of the derivative, but the derivative doesn't have a particularly uh, attractive expression, right? So this is the derivative. It's not so easy to tell what the sign of this thing is as we um, as we vary x. Yeah? So instead, we're going to use the classical way to do the closed interval method. We're going to stick in the numbers into the endpoints. So if we consider t of 0, if we put 0 into this expression, this will be 3 over 6 plus 1. So it'll be 1.5. So that's how many hours. It'll take him if he just directly went to B and then ran down. At the critical point, T of 9 over square root of... Uh, T of 9 over square root of 7. Uh, this is 1 plus square root of 7 over 8, which is equal to 1.33 approximately after the second decimal place. And t of 8 
is 1.42 or approximately and we see that the smallest of these numbers is this guy so t of 9 over the square root of 7 is the smallest and so the global minimum. Cool. So if it goes directly to B and then runs down, it takes him an hour and a half. If he rows directly to C, it takes him 1.42 hours. And if he does his calculus, finds the optimal x, rows to that optimal x, and then runs down, it takes him 1.33 hours, right? So he will save about, uh, he will save about 0 0.09 of an hour, which is uh, a bit less than six minutes. He will save himself about six minutes from being able to do some calculus, yeah? So maybe he maintains his freedom. All right, it's a, a joking example, but it shows again the power of this stuff. We can look at a situation like this. We can reformulate it in maths, yeah? and then we can actually find the solution, we can quantitatively find the solution. We don't have to guess. We can find it. Yeah? Cool. All right, so with these examples, let's summarize how this actually works, what we've actually been doing. One, read problem. Draw a diagram introduce notation. Yeah. Then formulate the constraint if there is a constraint. So in the first one, the constraint was that the total amount of fencing was 1200. Second one, the constraint was that the volume was 1000. So formulate constraint and quantity to be optimized in math in the first two examples we had that the quantity optimized had two variables so we had to use the constraint to turn it into a function of one variable so if needed Turn quantity into function of one variable. And then we are back in the territory of just straightforward calculus exercise of the kind that we've done many times. Huh? And solve or optimize using calculus. Or find the find the absolute max or absolute min using calculus. Just like in the uh, related rates question or related rates topic. The, the, the main new thing and the harder thing is to read a bunch of words and then to understand what that is actually saying and then introduce some notation to describe these quantities that, that, that give the constraint if there is one or give the quantity that's being optimized if there is one. That's the part. That's the human skill that is really worth learning and getting good at. Now, once you've done that, once you've expressed things in the language of math, 
then the actual solving of the problem is usually fairly straightforward. Yeah. So uh, this is something to bear in mind if you are not captivated yet by the importance and value of this. You can think of any number of situations where there is some optimization problem which you can actually attack and solve with this kind of stuff that you can't without. So this is a real, real physical world human importance and it is worth your while getting good at this kind of thing, getting fluent in this language. All right, that's it for today. Have a great day.